this show won't start, folks. <laughs> I'm walking backwards for Christmas. Oh, the Irish. I was going to play one of Chopin's etudes, and then I thought, why should I? <laughs> he never plays any of mine. When you do a style of comedy that's that far off reality, it's, it's strange, but it actually means you capture more people, because everybody can relate to it in the same way, because it's, it's so out there. never say the spike was influenced by anybody. You can't think of anybody who you could say, oh, that was a forerunner of spike. Spike was never satisfied with the way comedy worked. Once he saw it working, he wanted to, to take it apart and push it into something more interesting, more original. Your face! <laughs> now your real face. <laughs> oh, Spike Milligan. Yes, I Spike. Who is Spike Milligan? A question often asked by his therapists. Therapists, when there's more than one. Who is he? You can't think of Spike without thinking of the word you need. <laughs> well, oh. Godfather of modern comedy. Yes, I am Socks Milligan. I think Spike Milligan is probably the most important influence in British comedy since World War II. Many might say Peter Cook, particularly the Oxford-Cambridge influence, particularly Cambridge and the footlights. But Cook always paid great homage to Spike Milligan. Those people always said, always paid tribute, first of all, to Spike, because without him, they wouldn't have known what was possible. He pushed the envelope out. He extended the boundaries of what was funny. Oh, it is fun to be on the telly again. <laughs> you got this new stereoscope coming out. Oh, yes, I've got this new stereoscope coming out. <laughs> 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 like friends? Oh, I... Well, hold this poker. Ah! Oh. We do all of our hang-ups, don't we? Oh, do we? Unfortunately, mine's hanging down. <laughs> Could the answer lie in the Paul Getty suite of the Paradise Hilton Bermuda? No. <laughs> He'd be despised if he were still on the circuit today. You know, we'd all be terribly jealous and bitching behind his back. These jockey pants, they're all right for jockeys. <laughs> but not for men who handle heavy machinery. No. <laughs> my God, a snooker in my own underpants. <laughs> and no chalk on me cue. <laughs> but my wife makes me wear them. It's just to make you look tidier. Spark used to do the most extraordinary things on the stage. He, he did something with a gun at the Met Edgware Road and shot himself, <laughs> or shot his foot. And there used to be a, on, on the front page of a, of a trade magazine called The Performer an act called Cardoma. He had a little box on the front page. He advertised himself and used to have a slogan, fills the stage with flags. So Spike, after this incident, took a little box advert, Spike Milligan, Fills the stage with blood. Good heavens! It's Richard the Third, Part One. Ah, <laughs> oh, that's Part Two. Right. Spike on stage, when he dried, which he did quite often, he not only looked over and uh, conversed with the prompter in the corner. He got the prompter <laughs> out on the stage. If you say I've made a mistake, 
People love it. I need in line a head, sir! Sorry, sorry, sorry. Hold it. What's this? It's known as a cock up. Spike came down to the footlights and played the most awful rendition of God Save the Queen. God Save the Queen. And the audience, of course, got to their feet. And at the end of that, uh, he said, if you'll stand for that, you'll stand for anything. To find out whether people actually did stand for the national anthem, we tried this simple experiment. <laughs> we used to go across the road at the Shepherd's Bush to go to have lunch at Bertorelli's which is not there now, alas, and it's next door to funeral undertakers. Next door, right next door. So we used to take turns in helping each other across the road because the traffic was murder, even in those days. And one of them had limped like that, and then the following, every spikes turned to limp, like, well, I helped him and stopped the traffic like that. And so they got to know us when we lunchtime, you know, and I think people t took different routes to go to different places. But I remember that funeral directors there, at one time we got to it, going to Bertorelli's for lunch, and he, Spike, lay down on the pavement like that, put his hand like that, and then he knocked on the window and he said, Chop! Earlier this evening, Spike Milligan died at his home in Barnet, aged 104. He'd say to me, you know, when I die, they'll say, oh, that's Spike Milligan, he wrote The Goon Shows and died. Because that's all he thinks. But I think there might be a little bit more than that. We have been asked to honour his memory in the way that he would surely have wished. BBC Two is now proud to present George Formby in Spare a Comedy. Now I go window cleaning. Stop it, I'm I still have my pride. He just pop up. I remember watching Right to Reply one day, and he just popped up in the video box. And it's like, it's Spike Milligan, for God's sake, you know, and he just pops up like just. Some old bloke just having a moan. Some swine said this made me look younger. He's not called Spike for nothing. Because Spike he certainly is. Do you find yourself looking back in your childhood? No, all? it hurts my neck. <laughs> my granny used to say, you never know when you have him. Spike was so proud of being Irish. I went to a fish and chip shop in Dublin. I said to the man at the other counter, I said, fish and chips twice. He said, I heard you the first time. <laughs> I went to the passport office with my British passport which I was born with, and some creep there said, you know, you're not supposed to have this passport. There's a law passed saying that any Irishman's father born in Ireland before 1908 is no longer entitled to a British passport. So I went to the Irish embassy and I said, can I get an Irish one? He said, oh, Jesus, yes. An awful shot of people. Irish doctors have carried out the world's first hemorrhoid transplant. <laughs> it was St. Patrick's night, and I drew a beautiful shamrock with a green, I never use the green, green there, and I came on stage and said, Happy St. Patrick's night. He said, Glory be to God, says Mike. From now on, ladies and gentlemen, the show's going to be Irish. And we went into, oh, you dirty, you dirty, you dirty, you presume to piss in the bed with the puss in the room and a wallop, you bum with a dirty great robe, but oh, you wake up in the morning time, we did a bit of Kelly dancing. And at Valentine Dial, who was uh, the man in black, uh, very sonorous, uh, sepulchral voice, he said, I'm terribly sorry, Spike, but I don't do Irish accents. And Spike said, well, all right, then. He said, just do your speech, but at the end of every speech you've got, say, at all, at all. He said, very well, at all, at all. And then the show was Irish that night. Wait her, wait yeah, her. Yes, yes, sir. There's a fly in my throat. Don't worry, sir. I'll save him. <laughs> the great thing that he had was his irreverence. Irreverence for everything, especially the conventions of comedy and the conventions of stage and the conventions of broadcasting. English teeth, English teeth, shining in the sun. A heart of British heritage I eat and have been born. English teeth, English teeth, hear them click and clack. Jumping down on bits of this and sausages pop down on bread. English teeth, hear old teeth. Oh, oh.
Not so fast, Fritz. All right. We surrender. The Second World War was crucial to that extraordinary sense of humor. It brought out the laughter in the face of unsurmountable odds. The backs to the wall, um, throw away the cigarette, I'll do this without a blindfold. That characterized Spy. Cigaretta? Nine! He's a greedy swine. <laughs> I started with the war. It gave birth to me. <laughs> It was a proud day for me and my family, as eight military policemen dragged me screaming out the house. And put me on a train for Bexhill. Bexhill was sort of a, an above-ground cemetery. <laughs> <laughs> they, uh, they don't bury their dead there, they put them on police duty. Yet. He wrote Adolf Hitler, my partner's downfall. And that was all based, you know, him in Bexhill. I, and I read all about it, and I went around Bexhill on my bicycle, trying to find out where. Spike had been stationed. I've marched before this major. I uh, said, I'm sorry I'm late, sir. And the sergeant said, Silence when you speak to an officer. <laughs> it's very difficult. If you want to do comedy and want to perform it, and you're living in Bexhill, because nothing really happens in Bexhill, it's very difficult to believe that it could take off. But the fact that he used to be in Bexhill, and the fact that I sold ice creams at the bottom of this hill, this hill, get this galley hill, there was a kiosk there, and I was selling ice creams, and he used to be stationed up there. So I used that in my head as a sort of, well, if it worked for him, you know. They took me to an M.O., a medical officer. He said, take your clothes off. I said, well, shouldn't you take me out to dinner or first something? <laughs> and then they handed me over to a Cockney rifle instructor. I didn't understand a word he said. He said, did it. Hey, what do you mean, did it? What did you do? Hey, baby. I mean, how did we win? Hey? Something about the British soldier. You will not give in. The Germans don't want to give in, but the British won't give in. Okay, so you won the war, but we claim second. <laughs> we beat the bastard. We really gave it to him. The gunners with all the shot. Fucking take that! And send this huge shell. Oh, God, yes, they did. He really enjoyed the freedom he'd fought for. The freedom of speech, the freedom of association. Um, and that's something that has, you know, once somebody broadens the, the, the gamut out, you move on from that and people broaden it further. But he broadened it out. Freedom in comedy. This is the BBC Home Service, but please don't take it too hard. Half second, sir. I third, sir. Motion carry. Huzzah, we're in. This means yet another extraordinary talking type wireless corn show. Imagine if, if Sartre had had influence on the Three Stooges. No. All right, let's go another way. It was El Alamein, 1942. <laughs> the sound of chickens has specially been added for people living in rural districts. <laughs> Rommel's treasure, part iron. The hindquarters of the Africa Corps. <laughs> Captain Moriarty. Yeah, my general. You are one of the few Captain Moriarty's I can trust. Thank you. Now we must bury the black box ten feet above the ground. But people will see it. That's a chance we will have to take. The goon show. You know, it's, it's pure madness. Hey! <laughs> I have been nutted. Nutted by a black box. It revolutionized how I looked at things. There was an immediate response in me to the kind of thing I heard on the goon show, the ridiculous, the preposterous. My father was clever. What did he do? Nothing. He was really clever. I had no idea how I started to write comedy. And the amazing part was, when I started to write it, I was bloody good. I was actually writing, breaking the bonds of comedy and reshaping them. 
I thought, wait a minute, this world is invisible. We can do anything. It's this darkness. You can't see a thing. Listen, what's making that noise? The cricket. How can they see the bat in this light? <laughs> A man just climbed over the garden wall. A boundary. Well played, Tom. The goons were absolutely right for their time because it's hard for people now to remember just how stuffy and correct and deferential English society was in the 50s. But with the goon show, there was that first flicker of rebelliousness that turned into the satire movement that started in 1962 with Beyond the Fringe, and uh, that was the week that was. What's the matter? What's the, what's the matter, bottle? I haven't had any sleep all night. Why not? You know that film room at the top? Yeah? Well, I'm in the room, I'm in the <laughs> It wasn't the kind of humour that appeals perhaps to other Europeans. It was the kind of humour that appeals to the British. A certain subtlety, a certain wordplay, a sense of the ridiculous, and the taking of an idea sideways instead of straight up in the air. The cat wants to go out! <laughs> what makes you think that, Min? Just put his hat and coat on. <laughs> those aren't rocks, those are alligators. I wondered why my legs were getting shorter. It's a lot of... <laughs> ta -ta 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 -ta. Ten miles he swam. The last three were agony. They were over land. <laughs> <laughs> this is an explosive that can only be heard by an idiot. And then there's no noise. And then all of a sudden... Like character comes running in. What was that noise? Some horrible noise! Ten years alone in the desert has softened his brain. He thinks he's two people. Now say after me, there is only one Eccles. There is only one Eccles. What about me over here? <laughs> then one of the episodes was selling fire insurance for the English Channel. Oh, it caught fire! The English Channel is on fire! What a bit of luck! My policy's matured. 48,000 pounds! I'm rich! I'm rich beyond my wildest dreams. Hands up, you devils! Oh, you know what? As soon as you told me it was a fake. What do you mean, Neddy? Back to oh. my aim to shoot the fire to kill. Oh. Good job! Hey. Hey, problem in the bathroom. <laughs> it's like sort of train spotting. In a way, you had to know some detail about particular characters. You had to have a preference. It wasn't good enough to say, I like engines. You had to know which particular line, which particular colour, which particular region. Same with the goons. They're rather like, uh, you know, the fact you couldn't support Sheffield United and Sheffield Wednesday. You had to choose. You couldn't support sort of Eccles and Blue Bottle. You had to be one or the other. I loved Eccles. I just loved him. I always remember him up in the crow's nest on a, on a, on a ship. Um, and he shouts, oh, he says, mine ahead, mine ahead. And there's a long pause, and he says, oh, no, it's one of ours. <laughs> Followed by an enormous explosion that lasts about three minutes, you know, and we just hear his voice going, oh. The audience became part of the gig, because the audience would buy into the, they would build their own images. So, I mean, you know, it's a thing that happens on radio. You, you, you're painting the pictures yourself. Now, help me get this piano back to England. I have an idea. We'll saw the legs off. There. I've sawn off all four legs. That's strange. The first time I've known of a piano with four legs. Hey, I keep falling down. <laughs> it sounded spontaneous. So when he sat down to write the goon scripts, he simply started with a, one line on, a, on the paper and uh, representing, say, the theme of a jazz team. It worked like jazz. In other words, he, he got a... It was a storyline, wasn't it? Uh, in which he, he went off in various different directions, but came back for the last eight bars. Wait, wait! It's come to a full stop. He is, of course, and, and anybody who ever met him knows that. 
or heard him talk about music, a frustrated musician. <laughs> Commercial television began in August of 1955. The first thing we did was to go to Spike Milligan. And we walked into his office. Spike was lying on the floor with his head, for some reason, in a huge hawser of rope. It was all run. And he, he lay there. He never looked at me. And he said, comedy will never work on television. If I want to write an idea of people going into an igloo and coming out at Hyde Park Corner, I can do it. But you can't. It'll cost you too much money. Because I'll take the budget. You've got to make your own money. <laughs> he managed in three series to so move forward what I felt were the boundaries of and the possibilities of television. With this new pill, you take one and you can watch any program of your choice. Three different programs in the same room at the same time. Thank you, Spike. Thank you. You have to take my head. <laughs> You're right, boy. That's an ad lib. <laughs> I can't see anything yet, can you? Oh, I can't see. I've ignored it. Ah, wait a minute. There's something coming through now. That little... Ah. Oh, there it comes. Ah, yes, sir. There it is. Here. There it is. <laughs> he was flying blind, working without a net. Spike had a grace, uh, as expressed through his comedy. He um, he wasn't daunted by the fact that he was expected to come up with something funny. He just came up with something funny. Legs are hereditary and run in most families. <laughs> I mean, um, um... Spike was very bold, you know. Spike just walked to the edge of the cliff and opened his mouth and did funny stuff all the way down. By the year 2000, the population of this world will be over 400 million people. And the United Nations are very anxious that we reduce these numbers. And here, we can all help. Don't put off till tomorrow what you can do today. <laughs> the goons changed radio comedy. It was never quite the same after the things they did on the Goon, the Q series. He shifted the boundaries again. He was doing things on television that had never been done before. Up he goes, doing nearly 75 miles an hour. He's well inside the record as he has yet another slice of bread, which will set him back months in his diet. And as a man in Lewisham goes into the gent's castle and strains over his skis, but wait, he's disappeared. That's incredible. Fantastic! Here, <laughs> yeah, Molly. I swear I heard an East German skier say, fantastic. This could be our lucky day. The mystery still surrounds the whereabouts of East German ski champion Fritz Krappenhauser. But this is Mr. Krappenhauser. Hey, Mr. Pardon me not getting up. A bat! Yes? I seek political asylum! You want Westminster? That's the finest fleet in the asylum in the world! <laughs> There's a huge liner on the stocks somewhere in one of the shipyards. It was called Q, and everybody knew it was going to be Queen Elizabeth in the end. So I just called the test for the hell of it. Why not? I could have called it X. <laughs> music. 69. It's a wrong way up. That's why you get a laugh. Right. 
when he went off the script, I was away because that's it for me. He he was very sensitive, and he was uh, his his perception of an audience reaction was very very acute, and within a hundredth of a second he could sense what the audience wanted or felt, and he he'd go another way. And wow, I loved it. Yes, what you want? Say the line again, darling. It's the wrong bleeding. What word. is it? Yes, what is it? That's better. It's a door knocker. <laughs> Madam, we are worried first about your amnesia, <laughs> and secondly, <laughs> and we are very worried about your personal hygiene. I changed them this morning. <laughs> what do you want? My card. Will you all come inside? When you see him inspiring the people around him, when you see the other people in the cast with that same kind of twitchy energy that that he had and that and it kind of spreads it's like a like a, an electric spark that sort of crackles through everybody it's it, it's brilliant and now what comes out of cows and rings like a bell what comes out of cows and rings like a bell Dung! <laughs> Take got rid of them. <laughs> what we have in common, just a strange, a distant desire to be bizarre. Glorious boating weather, southerly blows the... <laughs> uh, pollution inspector here is in the bathtub. I'm sorry, sorry, you have to donate. I'm talking about you, sir. I beg of you to give me your support. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Trust. And then he comes out of the toilet going, Was there a man here asking for money? Lieutenant Clapper of the sewer squad. We're looking for a man called Pontius Keck. A rather nasty con man. You haven't seen him any chance. He looks rather like me, sir. It's like an old English toilet where you go up and then the, the actual water cabinet's up here where the water comes from and all of a sudden the camera goes, and then the next shot, it, he appears from up there. I should get a, a strong mortise lock put on that lid if I were you. It had a lot of levels. That's it. A lot of levels. A lot of levels. Sounds like a singer in Germany in 1936. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Lot of Levels. I was liberated working with Spike. He's a bit of an anarchist in a way, and so am I. Uh, the sort of humour was surrealist, and so am I. And I cottoned on to the way he worked, and I loved it. Tonight, a tribute to the late Sir Edward Elgar, whose favourite instrument was the <laughs> was the B flat garden hose, for which he wrote many great pieces, including. Underneath the armpits, <laughs> do my names away. Right. Spike used to laugh at the things that he came out with as though they'd come from outside, as though they'd come from somewhere else, and he'd never heard them before. There was a wonderful feeling there that uh, the, the things that came out of his head surprised him as much as anybody else. Bitte, bitte, get this off line in my throat, Jewish wine! <laughs> he challenged us with where he was going with his jokes and his sketches and his ideas. I mean, they didn't always make me laugh, I have to say. Uh, sometimes he would have ideas and I would think, hang on, this is probably very funny, but it's not making me laugh. And, but that didn't matter to Spike. It made him laugh, or he thought it was funny, and he would push it through relentlessly. Tonight, folks, we're going to play Where Does It Hurt? A game where we here in the studio draw attention to all those wonderful sporting contestants who are in pain and suffering. Now, the way to play Where Does It Hurt is this. If you can think of any aspect to bring this game alive, just write it on a postcard and send it to us, care of Where Does It Hurt? Remember, somebody else's suffering can bring a great deal of pleasure to others. Oh! <laughs> 
Come on, this could be the holiday of the side of France for us. Get out. <laughs> None of us in this game can be funny all the time, but he had a higher scoring rate than most. I'm going for the big one. Extreme agony. <laughs> Fought against payoffs. If you have a payoff to a sketch, you have this mental thing of the curtains closing with, da da, that's the end of the sketch. So Spike said, How can we fight this thing of payoffs? So what we did was we made no pretense of anything. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll end the sketch while the audience are still totally baffled. I said, What's the payoff in this sketch? I said to him. There was, no, there was nothing happening with the sketch. I said, What's the payoff? And he said, I haven't got a payoff. I said, Well, what, what are you going to say? What is it? And he said, we're all going to get into a little group and say, what are we going to do now? 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 In the next studio, the, the, the Monty Python crowd were there. And they used to come in and watch us rehearse. And Spike would shout, get those bums out of here. They're stealing all my material. They're nicking my stuff. And of course, John, Cleese and Michael don't hide that. They say Spike was one of their greatest influences. That was, uh, a, you know, a great inspiration to see Spike doing characters who... You know, still, you know, they would do a character and it would put a caption up saying, you know, John Bluthall, take home pay, <laughs> £44.33 a week or something like that. Uh, characters coming out of wardrobe with the wardrobe tags still on. The entire, you know, sort of production being done with these tags on. Little things like that. I rang Terry and I said, he's done what we were going to do. And Terry said, I know. We'll have to go another step. So he kind of nudged us forward to be even crazier than we were intending to be. Now, he thought to take you to bed. The land of the hope and the glory. They're ignoring me now. They won't even give it a reprieve like Dad's army. <laughs> They're being very cruel to me to ignore this show, which was innovative. Very innovative. Have you tried to get an explanation from them? Why? No, I get bland letters. They're a lot of bastards. You're a lot of bastards. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, say it with flowers. <laughs> We'll get these viewing figures up if it's the last team to do. <laughs> there was a young man called Wyatt whose voice was remarkably quiet. And then one day it faded away. There's <laughs> the difference between nonsense and stupid. And what I like, there's a certain stupidity. Um, you're, you're really straight out there, really daft rather than nonsense. Nonsense is a bit more refined. And this is a bit beyond nonsense, and I quite like that. Oh, the ling ling nong! The cows go bong! And the monkeys all say, boo! There's a long ling ling! But the trees go ping! And the teapots tip a tap a choo! On the long ling ling! All the mice go clang! And you just can't catch them when they do! So it's ling ling nong! The cows go bong! Nong nang ning, trees go ping. Nong ning nang, mice go clang. What a noisy place to belong! Is the ning nang ning nang nong. <laughs> but some of them are quite harsh. He shows the hurt. He lets you see the emotion. You don't have to dive for it. Is that all there is? Goodbye. After a million hellos, after all those bird blessed good mornings after the bubbling bath time laughter, after so many soul-searching Santa Claus, after a million wild walks on the moors. After the new wear them in bed red shoes, after a tumult of timeless teddy bears, after a delirium of dolls in prams, after a rainbow of ice creams after daddy I love you all the world goodbye you want to listen to him 
I always wanted to sit at his feet, almost, you know, and touch, touch the hem of his garment. If I wanted to make a religious, a religious statement, touch the hem of his garment because you felt a better person when you you actually, you know, sat with him. I was on duty at this observation post, and one evening. A uh, crowd of them came up. Churchill, uh, Lord Alan Brooke was there, and uh, I, silly, I said, Halt, who goes there to Churchill? I mean, <laughs> and, and he said, um, uh, what, um, uh, uh, what do you, what do you do? And I said, I do my best. <laughs> and he said to me, he said, well, the way things are, that might not be good enough. He was a good storyteller. He believed in the story because of the richnesses and the complexities of our lives. We're all wrapped up in stories, and when you tell a story, you can please or offend, make you laugh, make you cry, make you hope or despair. And Spike gave me all those feelings listening to him telling a story. Please believe me, this is true. A friend of mine, he got dysentery on the way to the station. He had a terrible accident, you know, and uh, he thought. <laughs> And uh, so he saw a supermarket, and he rushed in, and he sort of walked around and said, Look, uh, can you have a... can I have um?" <laughs> and he said, keeps it. And I said, I've got a disease of the legs. He said, I can't... And they said, um, can you give me a pair of underpants and a pair of trousers, medium size? He said, well, wait, wait. He said, no, I've just got to park the car. So he kept moving around outside. He looked through the window and said, oh, I've got him right. So he came in and got this plastic bag. And uh, gave me the eddy part with the, with, the, with the trousers and things in it. Rushed up with the train, and by then it was, it was rush hour. And he thought, my God, I can't go in a compartment. He's just reeking by now, you know what I mean? <laughs> so he thought, ah, the loo, the car seat. So he got into the car seat, locked the door like this, and waited for the train to start, and then he took these trousers off and, he's, and these underpants, and he threw them out the window. <laughs> right? The pants off for that. And then he opened the plastic bag, and it was Lady's pink cardigan. <laughs> he doubled up, he could hardly get through the story, and it was the most infectious thing. So he's wearing a Toby hat, a jacket, collar and tie, and naked from the waist downwards with the pink lady's cardigan. So in desperation, he pulled his legs. <laughs> he pulled his leg. Suddenly <laughs> 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 so realised where the neck was, all his wedding tackle was hanging out. He must have told that story many times, but it always seemed to come at him as a surprise. So, so, so he's just coming up the platform, so he thought, he, that's the English at the best, and so he took his chubby head off, and he tucked the, tucked the, he tucked the brim all the... <laughs> now, some calming words. Librium, valium, mother. <laughs> I first went to work for Spike in 1966. He had all the windows open, and it, that very small back office in Orm Court, and he had a filing cabinet, and I couldn't believe how organised the room was. It was just not his persona. And on the top of the cabinet, he had um, a box of swoop. Do you know what swoop is? No. It's wild bird seed. And I thought, oh, he feeds the wild birds. He can't really be all that bad. And Spike and I still to this day blame it on a packet of swoop, always. See, if it wasn't the soup, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> nice little birdies. Don't be frightened of them, Dad. Come on. There, all for you. <laughs> and of course, he prattles on forever and ever about overpopulation, and he was doing it then and he's still doing it now. That's his, that's really his hobby horse. Contraceptives should be used on every conceivable occasion. <laughs> his greatest asset is his compassion. And that's total. I mean, his compassion is boundless. His not very good trait is his disloyalty to the people who were very loyal to him. We had an argument over one word. Uh, I said, no, we didn't need that word. He said, we do, we do. He's got a rhythm to it. I said, no, it doesn't matter about the rhythm. If it goes like that, it flows. If it, what's got? No, I'm sorry, but you no. Know, it's, it's moisture. And it, he picked up a paperweight and he threw it up, and I went like that, and he went right through the window, <laughs> crashed the glass, and fell down five floors onto the pavement. Why somebody was not killed, I'll never know. Duck behind the couch. There is no duck behind this couch. 
At one point, he attacked uh, Peter Sellers, tried to kill him with a spoon. He wanted to come and play records, and I was ill in bed. I wanted peace and quiet. And he was playing these records, and I'd got this potato knife, and I'd threaten them with it. Mind you, he had retribution because at three o'clock next morning, there's a knock on my door. I went to the door, and there was Sellers, stark naked, except for a jewelry and shoes. And he said, do you know a good tailor? You get a knock on the door, and a uh, guy opens the door, and there's two vicars standing there, but they've got stocking masks over their faces. <laughs> he said, yes, who are you? He said, we are Jehovah burglars. <laughs> Oh, yeah, he said, well, yeah, we are, we are seeking refuge from the police who are persecuting us because of our beliefs. So we said, well, what are your beliefs? He says, we believe you've got a lot of money in this house. And he's on top form and he's funny, there's nobody like him in the whole world, but equally the mood can change and like that. I remember doing a television with him and Harry Seacombe, an old Wogan, and there's very few things older than Wogan, and... Harry and he had bantered back and forward, and then he said something as Spike would, rather abrasive. And Harry said to me afterwards, he said, I said, he always ruins it. <laughs> and Spike Milligan often ruined it, but most of the time enhanced it. A man can't have everything. I mean, where would he put it? <laughs> I think I'm right in saying that he's manic depressive in a, in a clinical sense, not an affective sense. He is genuinely manic depressive, which resulted, it seemed to me, in cyclical behaviours, like a, almost as regular as the phases of the moon. So that you would work with Spike and there would be a 14-day period, if you like, when you were going up to a wonderful sort of peak. And that period in the three or four days before you reached the peak always seemed to me to be the most uh, excitingly creative time. I got idea! Doot, 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 doot. <laughs> Cheap Japanese light bulb! <laughs> doot, 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 doot. <laughs> Gone already! <laughs> By the time you got to the peak, it was all too fast. The ideas were spinning around the room and bouncing off the walls, and you couldn't really catch them. And then you start going down the other side, which meant that the door was locked, and he stayed there, and he was just on his own and feeling God knows what he was feeling. I've been in and out of psychiatric homes. I can give you a list of them. I said, what are you doing? They said, I'll give you electric shock treatment. I said, well, look, I'm a shareholder in Eastern Electricity. Could you put as much electricity to send up the shares on the stock exchange? I've never seen the sad side of, of Spike Milligan at close hand. I've seen him depressed. I've seen him, because he's getting older now, I've seen him look weak. I said to the surgeon, what are you going to do? He said, we're going to do a quadruple bypass. I said, well, would you unblock the M25, the M40? And the A20. So they went ahead and I, I wrote on my arm here, do not chop this off. It writes the checks. And yet he will always surprise you. You think he's looking terribly frail. And then he'll, he'll stand up at a dinner or lunch and say something absolutely hilarious. Here we go. I have a letter to read out here from His Royal Highness the Prince of Wales. Do I kneel down for this? <laughs> As someone who grew up to the sounds of the goon show on the steam-driven wireless, I must confess that I've been a lifelong fan of the participants in the show, and particularly of Spike Milligan. Oh, the little groveling bastard. <laughs> what happened that night at the Comedy Awards? I mean, you never had that in your mind to say that, sure, he's a pirate. Or did you? Well, uh, I, didn't know, I didn't know I was going to get the award. Uh. I, I just thought I was there as dressing, and uh, I drank two bottles of wine. I felt very good. And, uh, you were happy, were you, Spike? Yeah. This is the word. <laughs> he thought it was funny. 
Zachary phoned me to tell me, don't stop. He's Chuckle's favorite clown. <laughs> He's like, I enjoy him so much. What did the prince say to you? He said, hello, Spike. And I said, yes. I said, hello, Prince, Prince Charles. A statistic would interest you. Uh, no dry cleaners in Peru. Good Lord. There are no dry cleaners in Peru. I mean, England loves eccentric, anyway. But he really is out there. And he's got that, 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 he almost gets that, like, fool's pardon. That you gotta, like, he could do anything and people go, mm, it's just Spike Milligan, you know. All of us would love to be able to do what he's doing at the age that he's doing it. He's a, he's a wonderful example of somebody who kicks against the traces and has now become, has now been embraced by the establishment. I think you should be Lord someone, don't you? Yeah. Lord someone. Who would you be? Lord, Lord uh, uh, Milligan of where? Anywhere. <laughs> That's it, Lord Milligan of anywhere. Spike is as about appreciated here as Marmite. I mean, I don't think people really know him, which is a, a loss for the people. We interrupt this interruption with this interruption. Please help get Spike Milligan to be appreciated in America. I know on the internet the nude pictures have helped a little bit. And we've actually had animal rights people saying, don't run those again. But please help. Help Spike be appreciated in America. Our number's flashing at the bottom of your screen. 1-800-976-SPIKE. God bless you. <laughs> when he dies, he wants to have on his tombstone, here lies Spike Milligan. I told you I was ill. He deserves at least one joke carved in stone. The one thing that made him a true hero of comedy is the fact that he had a brain that could go where no brain has gone before. Oh, uh, bless him. I think, I hope we go together, because I'd hate to be in a world where he wasn't. Deutschland, Deutschland, you will... I'm a stay spike. I'm a stay. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs>